Hello everyone, I'm Laura Flanders. Welcome to this special program, What's at Stake? Healthcare for All, a joint production of Free Speech TV and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. We're coming to you from MNN's fabulous facility at El Barrio Firehouse here in East Harlem, New York. In the coming hour, we will break down the issue of health care. Is it a right or a privilege? And discuss whether Medicare for All, government-sponsored single-payer health care, is the best way forward or not. We'll be talking with special guests, including Nina Turner, a national surrogate for Senator Bernie Sanders during last year's Democratic presidential primary race. She is now president of Our Revolution, an organization created by Senator Sanders to revitalize American democracy. Also Donna Smith, executive director of Progressive Democrats of America and a three-time cancer survivor whose struggle with the U.S. healthcare system was chronicled in Michael Moore's documentary, Sicko. Finally, Joshua Holland, a radio host and writer who contributes to Rolling Stone and The Nation and says Medicare for All is definitely not the best way forward. I'll be back in a moment to tell you more about what you're about to see and hear, so please stay with us. from our guests, we'd like to take a few moments to bring you up to speed on what is now at stake with the issue of universal health care. What exactly does Medicare for all or single payer mean? And what might be the best next step in the decades long march to expand access to health care for all U.S. citizens? Bernie! 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 When he ran for president last year, Bernie Sanders made the right to health care one of the pillars of his campaign. And many of you are underinsured with high deductibles and high co-payments. In calling for the creation of a national universal health care program, Senator Sanders stood alone among the candidates. Health care is a right of all people, not a privilege. But last month, when he introduced a new Medicare for All bill, one third of Senate Democrats stood by him. Today, all of us stand before you and proudly proclaim our belief that health care in America must be a right, not a privilege. The senator's endorsement was the latest step in a decades-long march to expand access to health care from Franklin Roosevelt's Social Security and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health to Medicare and Medicaid under Lyndon Johnson and most recently, Barack Obama's Affordable Health Care Act. We are here today to take another step. We will not back down in our protection of the Affordable Care Act. We will defend it at every turn. But we will go further. We will go further and we will say that in this country, everyone, everyone gets a right to basic health care. Sanders' plan offers a clear blueprint for fundamentally reshaping the American health care system by moving the country to a government-run single-payer program, one in which Americans would receive a universal Medicare card for comprehensive health care services. Activists from the progressive grassroots movement that fueled Sanders' presidential campaign hailed the measure. You know that Bernie is right. National Nurses United Executive Director Roseanne DeMauro. We believe that when patients are in jeopardy because of a lack of health insurance, it's essentially immoral. What we find that other countries have been able to do that we somehow can't figure out how to do is to provide a more cost-effective health care, to provide health care that provides greater access, is the costs are lower, and that's a single-payer universal Medicare for All system. Until recently, Medicare for All has been largely regarded as politically impossible. Sanders' campaign changed that. Medicare for All has become the default position for progressive Democrats, at least among those thinking of running for president in 2020. And polls now show a majority of Americans also support the idea. But opposition remains, and not only from Republican lawmakers. Health industry lobbyists like David Merritt of America's Health Insurance Plans say single payer will never work. Whether it's called single payer or Medicare for all, 
Government-controlled health care cannot work. It will eliminate choice, undermine quality, put a chill on medical innovation, and place an even heavier burden on hard-working taxpayers. Brent Saunders, chief executive of the multinational pharmaceutical company Allergan, recently warned investors at a health care conference that sooner or later Americans may embrace single payer. Ultimately, someone's going to be in the White House, somebody's going to be in Congress, someone's going to be somewhere and going to have to say, enough's enough. Let's just change the whole system. Let's go to one payer. Let's do something. There are also many Democrats and liberals who oppose the Sanders plan. The current proposals for Medicare for All, I think, are flawed. Joshua Holland criticized Medicare for All in an influential article in The Nation. I don't think that the left has done a good job of really grappling with how hard it is to transition a system that represents 18% of the economy into this single-payer model. Holland and other critics believe moving beyond Obamacare may involve a complicated and difficult mix of government and private health insurance. Meanwhile, with Republicans in control of Congress and the White House, the Medicare for All bill has little chance of soon becoming law. But it will serve as a political manifesto, a basis for discussion, and a platform for progressive Democratic candidates going forward. As Dylan Matthews recently noted in Vox, there is an emerging party consensus on health care. Over time, some issues become so widely accepted within a party as to be a de facto requirement for anyone aspiring to lead it. And the way things are going, soon no Democratic leader will be able to oppose single-payer. The crisis we are discussing today is not really about health care. Crisis we are discussing today is a political crisis which speaks to the incredible power of the insurance companies, the drug companies, and all those who make billions of dollars off of the current system. The precise way forward is still uncertain, but for now, at least among progressives, the always difficult conversation about how to craft an efficient and affordable way of delivering and paying for universal health care will center on some form of single-payer system. I bring you word by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said the following, he said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Nina Turner has a lifetime commitment to progressive ideals and values. From her days in elected office in Ohio to her high-profile support of Bernie Sanders' campaign to her current positions as president of Our Revolution and founding fellow of the Sanders Institute, she has long been an active and articulate agent of social change. Welcome. Glad to have you, Nina. Thank you. So good to be here with you. Let's start where you end. In what ways is health care an inequality issue? You know, when you have people based on income or based on job or lack of income that don't have access to high quality health care, and as somebody who served on the local level of government first, where you can't run, you know, your constituents see you in the grocery store, they see you at doctor's appointments, they see you at funerals. As a Cleveland City Councilwoman, I became very intimately involved in the lives of my constituents and to see the suffering. Uh, over a period of time of people who did, did not have access to high quality health care. Health care is personal. Mm -hmm. And so to me as somebody who is in the elected ministry, and I like to call it that because I happen to believe that people who serve people should like the people that they serve and care about the people that they serve, that the inadequacies in health care are, are strong, they're deep. So talk about it. I mean, what was it like being a legislator on this issue? Because you were hearing from your constituents on the one hand, yes. but you were hearing from a whole lot of other people, I'm assuming, on the other. I mean, tense. It really is. And that's why we need a national way to deal with that. I mean, if we do it state by state, it doesn't necessarily work. We as a nation have to have a commitment to say that health care for all is a right. It is not a privilege that it should not be based on a job that you have. People lose jobs all the time and it impacts their quality of life. And that in a civilized society in the 21st century, why can't we do it? Every other nation has done it. Why can't we do it? Are they any better than us? Mm -hmm. I believe that if we can go to the moon, we might be able to find, figure out a way to have 
health care for all in this country. But as Bernie Sanders says, Senator Sanders says, in that package we just saw, this isn't really about health care. Right. What's it about? It's about political will. It's about the courage to do what is right. We could have had it a long time ago, man. As you know, we've been working towards this for many generations. But even President FDR, in I believe it was in 1944 when he had the Economic Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. within that package, within that list, he said what Americans can expect or should expect. Health care was on that list. The yeah. good job was on that list. Education was on that list. Being able to provide as a society for people who cannot necessarily provide for themselves, all of that was on the list. So we've been working towards this for a very long time. So what has been, what's made it so difficult? I mean, there have been people with the will, as we just saw, for 105 right. years. No, I know. Well, p politicians, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, the medical industry, profit over people. And I'm talking about excessive profit. I mean, we know we live in a capitalist society. Get it. People have a right to make a profit, but extreme profit, profit to the extent that people are dying. A lot of people I've met cannot even afford to get the prescriptions that their doctors write yeah. for them. Yeah. You know, so we have to have politicians who don't who understand that they're not owned by their donors. And did you feel that pressure even there in Cleveland? Yeah, I mean, you feel the pressure. You feel it on state level. ALEC, as, as we know, I mean, there are groups American out here. American Legislative Exchange Council they, and Conservatives. They write legislation for elected officials and say, here, take this and, and get it passed. And then also the one-sided nature of state legislatures and even in the Congress, because Democrats have lost over 1,100 seats over eight years. Yeah. I felt the pain of that in the Ohio Senate, where my caucus, my Republican colleagues didn't even need my caucus to come to the floor to mm. be able to conduct the people's mm. business. And so that is why we need more people to mm. come out and let their voices be heard. So it feels like this moment, something has shifted. Yes. Talk about it. What I has mean, led the to this moment? How does it feel to you? It feels like it's, it's possible. I mean, just look, even the clip we saw that you narrated beautifully, I might add. <laughs> but, you know, when Senator first introduced his bill, no one would touch it. Right. Now he has about 16 co-sponsors you know, who have stood up to say, yes, we should work towards a Medicare for all. And then I, wanna, I don't want to leave out Congressman John Conyers right, either. He's been, been introducing his bill since 2003. It's the same thing. Yeah. No one would touch it. And now he has 119 co-sponsors. So this is an idea whose time has come. But it didn't come because politicians certainly got a clue. It has come because of the quiet, the gentle, not, not so quiet, but the push of the grassroots. Mm. Organizations like National Nurses United who are... You know, when a nurse stands up and says that we should do something, baby, we ought to listen. Mm. But it's just everyday people saying to elected officials that this is something that we should do in this country. Now, Nancy Pelosi, um, when she was talking with Joy Reid at, Reid at 92nd Street, why not so long ago, talked about this being exactly the moment not to push for anything other than a defense of the Affordable Care Act because we're in such a dangerous moment vis-a-vis -vis the attacks coming from the right. We're always in a dangerous moment. <laughs> You know, I mean, when is there, there's never going to be a perfect moment. Yes, we should defend the Affordable Care Act as we have been defending the Affordable Care Act. But that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. That was the floor. It was not the ceiling. So when is going to be the right time? Mm -hmm. You know, it is the fierce urgency of now, as Dr. King often talked about in different movements in this country. Ten years from now, someone might say the same thing. There's never going to be an ideal moment. Mm -hmm. But why not push right now? So... Lay it out for us. What exactly do we mean when we say Medicare for all? That every resident of this country would have access to health care. They wouldn't have to worry about deductibles. They would go in and have that health care. And not only is it a moral thing on the medical side, but also I've talked to numerous doctors who are overburdened with paperwork. Their staffs are overburdened with paperwork. This would lift some of that burden off of them, too. And just even economically, I mean, over the next 10 years, I think it's estimated that $40 trillion spent. We don't have the same level of health outcomes, but we spend more money than any other industrialized nation. But people could get the care that they need. It would be portable. It wouldn't be tied to a job. They would have it as just a matter of being a citizen of the United States or a resident of the United States of America. No, it wouldn't Why come free. There is no, I mean, a, a price tag attached to that. And with respect to California's effort right now, they're estimating the cost at something like $400 billion, a lot of it coming from taxpayers. I mean, there's a cost to everything that we do. But we prop up corporations every day and nobody bats an eye. We just bailed them out mm -hmm. and nobody bats an eye. So it is an investment. Yes, there's a price tag, but there's an investment in this. And what 
American families would save from not having those deductibles is worth the investment. Our tax money, it's our tax money. It's not the, it's not the elected officials' tax money. Sometimes they act like it's their money. It's our money. And if the majority of the American people are saying this is the time to invest that money in ensuring that we have universal health care in this country, why wouldn't we do it? It is an investment and it is worthy. Talk a little bit about this question that people have of government control. When they use the language government controlled health care, everybody freaks out. God. I mean, <clears throat> we, have, we have Medicare and Medicaid right now for our, our elders and, and Medicaid for younger folks and, and disabled folks, and it's working. You don't hear many seniors jumping up saying, you know, take away. I don't want it. They want it. Government control. In order to have clean water, we need government control paved roads, government control. We are the government. Mm -hmm. Again, those are massive investments in the greater good. You know, government was designed for us to do collectively what we cannot do as individuals. That is what government is all about. When natural disaster hits, and I'm not trying to be flip here, but nobody's saying private sector help me, mm -hmm. they're asking for the government. When it comes to your own individual health care, I think people have a fear that there's going to be some collective decision about what health care you get. No, they, that's not they, how it's going to work, that is it? is not. I mean, the private sector, I mean, it'd be government paid for our money, but it would still be your private doctor doing it. So people shouldn't fear that. What I fear is not doing it. Yeah. And to continue to have people not be able to afford their prescription drugs so that they can't maintain their quality of life or not being able to go to a doctor in time. I talked to a doctor in Texas and she told a story about how she would see so many of her patients who had cataracts, they had glaucoma, they had, and they only came to her on the verge of blindness mm -hmm. because they couldn't afford the glaucoma medicine. Those kinds of things should not happen in the United States of America. So I fear more of, of what would happen if we don't do it mm. than if we do do it. It's worth it. I'm Is good. it going to be bumpy a little? Yeah, absolutely. Anything. But, you know, President Nelson Mandela once said it always seems impossible until it is done. That is what Medicare for All is about. It seems impossible now, but we're going to do it. And two and three and four generations from now are going to look back and say thank you. Is this the moment, given what we're up against in Congress, what progressives are up against in Congress. Yes, it is the moment. Push How hard so? at all times. I mean, we have the attention. The Republicans have failed to repeal, thank God Almighty, the Affordable Care Act, try as they might. I know the president now is doing executive order stuff. But it is in this moment mm -hmm. that people are peaked and they understand what is at stake. Why not keep going? So as we prepare, we have to be prepared for when we have a Congress and when we have a president that is open to this idea. You don't do it then, you don't get ready. We need to, to, or we need to prepare for that moment right now. Finally, in your view, what is a healthcare system for? Prevention, keeping people healthy, not at, on the back end, but on the front end. A lot of people are unhealthy right now because they go when they're in crisis. We're paying right now. Let's just be honest. We pay when people take, do uh, primary health care in emergency rooms. Right. We're paying now. So why not pay on the end that is preventative and more productive so that people can live strong, vibrant lives? Our health really is our wealth. Health care is not about pharmaceutical companies. It's not about the medical industry. It is about the health and well-being of the individual. But we're treating it as if we owe the medical industry and the pharmaceutical industry something instead of doing the right thing for the people in this country right now today. We can do this, and we must do it. How is this personal for you? Oh, my God. Well, whew, my mother died very young, you know, at the age of 42, very young. 42 years old, seven children. I'm the oldest of those seven children. I was 22. My baby sister was 12. And, you know, when I think about it, she died with her dreams deferred. You know, Langston Hughes asked that in his poem, what happens to a dream deferred? Access to health care. You know, and, and that's personal to me. She went into a coma, aneurysm, coma, and then, you know, no more. And at the age of 22, I had to pull the plug on my mom. And, uh, it is very personal to me, and I don't want any other mother or father or sister or brother to have to know what it means to have your dreams deferred. My mother died on the system of welfare. Mm. You know, she didn't have a life insurance policy and she didn't have any money in the bank. So the push for this is vitally, uh, it is personal to me because I don't believe that we should leave anybody behind, especially when it comes to their health. When people are healthy and vibrant and when they have access. They can change the world, but you can't do that if your burden, you know, most of the bankruptcies in this country, as you know, are based on 
health care and not being able to afford to to take care of yourself. So I'm trying not to We're going to hear more about right that in now. just a minute. Oh, yeah. I would say her dream deferred turned into a rock star of a change maker. Oh, thank Nina thank Turner, you. thank you so much. Stay with thank us. You. We'll be right back in a moment when Nina and I will be joined by Donna Smith of the Progressive Democrats of America and Joshua Holland of The Nation magazine to talk about what is at stake in the ongoing battle for universal health care. I'm Laura Flanders. Welcome back. I'd like to begin our panel discussion by asking Joshua Holland about his recent article in The Nation magazine asserting that, quote, Medicare for all isn't the solution for universal health care. Josh, why not? Well, I think that um, we all share the same principle. We start from the same principle that health care should be a human right and it should be guaranteed by the government and the same goals, which are um, universality, equity, uh, cost containment, affordability, and uh, for those of us on the left, uh, reducing the role of profits in healthcare. And I think that the, the, the key point that I wanted to make in that piece is that different countries have put together different kinds of healthcare schemes. You know, I think that single payer, in a, in a way, is a little bit of a misleading label because it I think it suggests to people that there are countries where the government taxes everybody a little bit and just pays for health care. That doesn't happen. Um, there, are, there are variations of how countries, how close countries get to that ideal, but none of them really do that. Uh, the Sanders plan is not a single payer plan in strict terms. It would leave about 7% of the public with multiple payers or other payers. And I think the important thing from my perspective is that there are a number of different ways to accomplish the goals that I just spoke of. And I believe that the specific proposals that we are considering now, the Sanders plan and the Conyers plan, are both the most disruptive in terms of the healthcare system, but also are the most politically problematic. Mm. Okay, so let me just roll back for two seconds to address one of the canards. I grew up in the UK, in the United Kingdom, yes. um, where we had a national health service. Yes. Owned by the government. Socialized medicine. Operated by the government. Doesn't mean you have a government doctor, exactly. No. But I got great care growing up. My family got great care. I have no problem with an NHS system here. But that's actually not what the Sanders plan or the Conyers plan is about, right? Can you, can you clarify? Or That's correct. Is it the same? Is it different? How so? Well, so you're talking about socialized health care, where the government actually provides the health care itself. So the runs NHS the clinics, runs the hospitals. owns the hospitals and, and uh, hires the physicians, uh, the nurses, everybody. It's, it's within that system. Um, we're talking about payers. We talk about single payer. Uh, I have a piece at The Nation talking about all payer, a single rate setter, which is a, a variation. And um, so, no, this is not about the government taking over health care um, as far as the provision of care. You know, doctors are still private actors. The drug companies will not be nationalized. Um, this is about a, a reimbursement system. It's about insurance. And we have public insurance and we have private insurance. Right now, we have almost 50% of our health care is financed through public insurance. But that's not a single payer within the public health care system. We actually do it through a fractured and irrational system. So Medicare and Medicaid, they don't negotiate prices together. There's a law that doesn't allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices with pharmaceutical companies. It's completely irrational. Is that what you mean by single uh, all payer? Well, all payers is a, is a somewhat different approach, and um, it, it has a, a single rate setter, so that wherever you go, you have the same, um, you pay the same for the same services. More importantly, it allows you to bargain with all of that collective market power, mm -hmm. the same as what we say, advocates of single payers say, you get a lot more of efficiency when you have this huge pool of people who are insured, well, you don't actually have to have them all in the same pool if they are all 
negotiating mm. collectively. So there are some other options, and I'd love you to address that in just a second. But you, my last question to just to make sure that we're, we're getting your critique is about the disruption quality of this proposal coming from the Sanders team. Why this plan, why is this disruptive? It sounds like simply an expansion of something we already have. There's two big issues as far as I see it. Um, about 68% of non-elderly adults in this country get their insurance through their employer. Uh, this has been the way it has been for 70 years. It's irrational, it doesn't make sense, um, but most Americans think of that as the way it works. These proposals compel, by law, 68% of non-elderly adults to give up their current insurance and go into another system based on our promise, the promise of people like us, that it will be better. Mm -hmm. And we know some things about the way people view health care. There's a concept called loss aversion. Mm. And this is a basic thing in economics. People value things more um, if they, that they might lose than something that you might promise them. Um, there's something called status quo bias. People tend to cling to what is familiar. And what we see with if you take a step back and you look at all of the public opinion surveys, you see that there is now majority support for the concept that the government should provide a guarantee of health care for all people. This is a huge, mm -hmm. huge mm -hmm. step, by the way. It wasn't that way 10 years ago. But what you see in the polls uh, asking about Medicare for all or single payer um, is decidedly soft support. Mm. So the Pew poll, for example, 62% said, we think the government should guarantee health care for all. They were given a choice. 33% said, let's do it all in one big government-run system. The rest said, let's have a blend of public and private, or we don't know. Um, in California, which is very blue, PPIC, which is a very good polling firm, they found 65% support for Medicare for all, for, for the California version of Medicare for all. But then when they were asked about um, uh, uh, the, the, the need to raise taxes for it, that fell to 42%. Mm. And I could go on. You see this in poll after poll. When they test the likely arguments that the opposition might make, um, support mm. falls dramatically. And just, I'm sorry, this is before it's been demagogued by the industry, by conservatives. And I just want everybody to remember just Keep in mind that a small amount of money for voluntary end-of-life services in the Affordable Care Act became death panels, faceless bureaucrats, killing your grandparents. Well, this goes back to what you were saying, Nino, about the, the, the challenge facing us. It's not small. No one's saying it's small. But let, let, let me bring you in on this, Donna. Are you just not worried about the disruption quality, this concern that, that Joshua was raising about how difficult this particular transition might be? It's not that we don't worry about a transition period, but what we have right now is so fragmented mm -hmm. that most Americans would far rather go through a little bit of disruption in converting to a social insurance model through the government than have this constant disruption in their lives that we see right now with this push me, pull me in political mm -hmm. terms. You know, depending on who's in power in Congress, who is who has their ideology wearing it on their sleeve and saying this is the way it's gonna be, who's misleading them about what single payer and Medicare for all looks like. All you really need to do is ask older people and disabled people if going on to Medicare was disruptive for them. When they became eligible, was it disruptive? The answer would be no. It wasn't any, it was anything but disruptive. It was wonderful for them to make the transition, to go away from being dependent on a private insurance model that is not working for many people and going to one that's gonna be steady and you know what it's gonna be, you know how it's going to work. The other thing I think Americans often don't understand because it's not explained to them, Medicare is really a centrist position. It's a good idea from the right, which is a, a private and public delivery, and a good idea from the left mm -hmm. in public pooling of financing. Together in a centrist position, it is not a lefty, liberal, socialist kind of thing. No, that's the one I'm for. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, I wouldn't have trouble with that either, obviously. But I, uh, for those Americans who might, who feel like they don't, they don't trust that that kind of model would work. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, yeah. in the UK these days, they say the wait period is an average of two hours. They have a lot of people turning to having private plans in addition to their NHS plan. So there, there are problems with the UK system, Of course, system but I had, a, I, I had an example in my own family just this week. My daughter told me that she's making a decision to take a granddaughter to a provider out of network because she was told the initial evaluation visit was going to be six weeks from now for the problem for an in-network provider, and that then treatment and, and any kind of medical follow-up that was needed, the appointments are now out into March of yeah. 2018. So we want to talk waiting periods. Yeah. That's with very good employer-based insurance so people know that there's problems. All right, so uh, thank you all. In a moment, we were gonna, we're were going to continue our discussion and hear more about what is at stake with universal health care and what it means for you. We'll also explore how you can get involved and a whole lot more. Welcome back. We're going to take questions from our studio audience in just a bit. But first, we're going to continue our discussion with three prominent advocates for universal health care. Nina Turner of Our Revolution, Donna Smith of the Progressive Democrats of America, and Joshua Holland of The Nation magazine. Donna, to you. Your personal story. A lot of people saw it in Sicko, Michael Moore's documentary. But for those who didn't, how did you get involved in this fight? <laughs> To give you just the Reader's Digest version, um, I have always been a little interested in health care. I ran uh, for the state legislature in Colorado, and one of my issues was health care. This was in 1986, so it's been a while. But as my family saw this drift of insurance coverage, we always had coverage, and less was being covered, and we were spending more out of pocket. We weren't silly. We got insurance. We had Affleck disability insurance to try and take up the slack. We had a small health care savings account, and yet we still went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And working as hard as we could, lost everything that we had worked a lifetime to really and achieve. how common is that? Very common. Up to 75% of the people who declare bankruptcy yeah. because of medical debt had insurance at the time that this happened. So I heard a comment earlier when we were getting dressed and getting ready for this program that people were, were postulating that people can't go bankrupt by just having 20% out of pocket. That's not true. 20% right. of $100,000 can bury you very yeah. quickly. Or a million and, dollars. Or a million dollars or whatever it may be. So I became involved, obviously, Michael Moore, received many quests, many people's stories. Mine was just one of them. And I tell people, no one is born on this earth thinking they want to be the subject of a Michael Moore documentary. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something one aspires to do. I usually use a little more colorful language, but I won't. And the reality is that through that process, I began saying yes to everybody who said, would you come? Would you yeah. talk about health care? And I've now been to, I don't know, 48 states mm -hmm. in Australia and Canada talking to people about why we have to move to a Medicare for all model. Even now in this argument in D.C., every time they talk about repealing the Affordable Care Act, I currently get my insurance through the exchange. As a 62-year-old three-time cancer survivor, there isn't an insurance company in the world that really wants to cover me. That's, I'm not one of the people they would like to have. And when, when they talk about cutting the subsidies, when they talk about cutting things, I have assured everyone and written about it very publicly, I will not walk the road I walked before. I, will, I would choose not to go on living rather than bury my family, my grandchildren, and future generations of people. So it's a very immediate concern for millions of people in this country. I'm not alone in that feeling. I know that. And I know it's uncomfortable, uncomfortable for people to hear that and know that, but it's the truth. Well, but you just mentioned the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, under the attack that it is under. Democrats are saying this is not a time to challenge it with a new conversation or a different conversation about Medicare for all. Are you not worried that you could lose even that which you have? 
No. In fact, I think unless we're talking about what we aspire to have happen, we will not get there. And I believe that the right message is the one that Bernie Sanders and 16 other senators in the United States Senate are saying we must work on what shores up the Affordable Care mm -hmm. Act, the good parts of it that need to be retained, and there are many good parts of it. And then we need to look at what would a better system mm. look like? What would it look like Can for the United States? Can we get to that through the ACA? I think so. Talk about that. I think so. I think that we can, you know, there have been various proposals about how we expand coverage and what age groups, you know, for years, people in the single payer Medicare for all movement said we ought to just tighten the, you know, bring it up from zero and start taking it down from 65. There are people who think that's a possibility. There are people who think that we expand that eligibility for people so that they're able to get it. Negotiating on drug prices, for goodness sakes. Yes. I mean, that's just a bare minimum. Who ever heard mm -hmm. of such mm -hmm. a thing? When so many people are on Medicare in this country and you can't negotiate the drug prices, that's right. that's that right. is a monopoly that's sinful and well, it's just really bad. But to go back to the yes. politics for a minute, um, Nina Turner, in California right now, there's yeah. not just a, a, a gubernatorial race that's happening, but a huge fight happening mm -hmm. around um, Healthy California, a bill mm -hmm. that you've, I've been involved in, I'm sure, mm -hmm. I, I, I know. There, when it came to the Democratic primary in the gubernatorial race, I read that health care was the only issue that really split the candidates. Mm -hmm. um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it, it is a good thing. And to Donna's point about this is the time, and I don't want people to see our aspiration to have Medicare for all as in comp being in competition Absolutely. with the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. The Affordable Care Act took us to the next level, but it is, it is the, the floor. It's not the ceiling. We have to go mm -hmm. to that ultimate level, which says that no one, I mean, did we just hear what Donna said? That if the subsidies are gone, what she is going to do at 62 years young, that is immoral in the United States of America. So if we can find en enough money to shore up the, the military complex, which we do, if we can find money to give corporate welfare to corporations that make money hand over fist, why can't we find the will? And it's not the people, it is the politicians mm. to find the will to do this. So Joshua, what do you think people should be doing if not? talking the language of Medicare for all. I mean, what's, what's your model? How do you move those, those markers in the p opinion polls in the way that you think they need to go? Well, I think that we should appreciate that the Affordable Care Act, for all of its blemishes, has changed the conversation in yeah. this country. And we saw it when Republicans went to, after seven years of demagoguing it as, you know, the worst thing short of a meteor destroying the country, um, they were unable to repeal it because people had gotten to the point where they understood the importance of having comprehensive coverage and not just show, you know, allowing people to go and get treated in an emergency room, change the discourse. And I think that, you know, we, we can build on the Affordable Care Act. I don't think that the proposals that are out there, alternatives to Medicare for All right now, are bold or visionary enough to really excite people. So one thing that I, I think is the best part of Medicare for All is how people respond to it. Um, activists, people in the progressive movement. I, you know, when you say, is this the moment? Obviously, this particular moment is one of defense. Um, that's true of all of our institutions. Um, we, we haven't it's been over three weeks at the time that we're taping this that they let funding for the children's health insurance program lapse. It's a, it's a moral abomination. Mm -hmm. So we have to protect mm. um, the Affordable Care Act. My concern is very simple, that instead of focusing on the principles that unite us, we are making a litmus test out of a specific policy approach that I don't think is the optimal mm. policy approach. Donna, we said we would tell people a little bit about how they could get involved. Um, what do you recommend? And I'm sure Josh and Nina have recommendations too. Well, but 
PDA takes pride in having been the original our revolution. We feel like uh, we Ooh, we I, uh, we, uh -oh. we petitioned Bernie Sanders to run as a Democrat back in 2013. So we're really proud, and we're so thrilled, so thrilled with where all of that became so powerful in this country. So pdamerica.org is where you would find us. We have chapters in almost every state except Alaska. If you're knowing someone there, do it. And one of the great things about PD America is that we do partner in many places and affiliate with our revolution because we're so closely aligned in our policies and our what we're doing. And we are brothers and sisters in this struggle. So we are so thrilled that Nina Turner is, it, is the head of that organization because it's brought an energy to that. So either way, yeah, pdamerica.org. I mean, and, and I guess I meant not just, I mean, yes, yeah. good plan. Yeah. Um, but we are talking about movement building here Absolutely. to sort of to shift the conversation, right? Yeah. And it's around elections. But at the very beginning of this program, we talked about it not just being about healthcare. It's about politics. Talk right. to people. Strategy. Yeah, I mean, have the conversation. I mean, for our revolution, we launched the People's Platform. Yeah. And of the eight pieces of legislation that have been introduced by members of the House of Representatives, representatives, we took Congressman Conyers' bill, Medicare for All. Mm -hmm. As one, so you got to call your elected mm -hmm. officials. But, but I agree with Donna. Have conversations in your Get community. Involved, tell your story. You got to. All right. Well, we're going to hear some stories from our um, members of the audience in just a moment. You're going to have, uh, they're going to have their chance to have their say. You are watching What's at Stake? Universal Healthcare, a joint production of Free Speech TV and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Stay tuned. Welcome back to our discussion of what's at stake, universal health care. It is time now for our studio audience to ask their own questions of our panel. Who's going to be first? Wouldn't it be right to tax the very rich more to keep affordable health care going? That's part Why of not the, just raise taxes? Yeah, I mean, that's part of the funding package that Senator Sanders is proposing, that there will be an increase on a certain population within the upper echelons of the economic spectrum in this country. But, you know, we do subsidize health care right now as a country, so a portion of that. And then a modest, you know, income tax increase, payroll increase for families that can afford it to be a sliding scale sort of thing. But yeah, part of it is increasing the taxes on the wealthy. So that already is in the package. Anything you want to add to, the, in, into that, the two of you? No, I think she said she it. She got it down. All right, next question. Right. She got it. Next, our next questioner. Thank you so much. Hi, this is for Josh or Joshua. Um, I'm really curious uh, to hear what an alternative model would be. So if you could just outline one or maybe two. Thank you. Well, um, so uh, there is a wonk gap in this whole discussion, which is that it's, it seems like there is among the kind of democratic leaning think tanks and uh, the folks who, who write for Vox and stuff like that, uh, a timidity that I don't think is, is uh, appropriate for this, this moment in time. Uh, so there are not a lot of different ones that have been well articulated. My proposal, which you can read at The Nation magazine, uh, and it's a long piece, I go to in, into it in great detail, it's hard to do in a very short amount, but basically instead of ex opening up Medicare as a benefit to the entire population and compelling those 68% of people who get um, their insurance or their job right now to shift over into the system, what I would do is raise and lower the eligibility age. I would cover everybody up to 18, lower the eligibility age to 55, consolidate Medicaid. We have to recognize that people in red states have been truly left behind um, thanks to the Supreme Court uh, decision that, that made it optional to expand Medicaid. So it would be rationalizing the existing public health care that we, we spend um, expanding public health care to older workers and young people, and then opening up Medicare for companies and individuals to buy into voluntarily uh, at their own pace. I think that if those of us who advocate single-payer type systems are right, if we're right about their benefits, 
then what we should see is that over a period of years, um, employers and individuals who are now buying insurance through the individual market will gravitate, but they won't be compelled to do so. Um, it'll take place over time. That will create less shock to the healthcare system. We should remember that this is a sector of the economy that employs one out of every 11 working people. They're not all fat cats, you know, driving Mercedes. Uh, we need to be careful about how we do this. This would allow the, um, this big chunk of our economy to adapt to these changes. Big chunk. We're talking 18% of, oh, of our GDP. Now, yeah. and Donna, isn't it true that Jacob Hacker, one of the designers of the single payer plan um, out of Yale, I think, he had a pl an idea that we would simply have kind of enrollment at birth into a Medicare type program and then if you wanted to choose later to then pick up private insurance you could do that. Wasn't that true? Part of Jack there Jacob's there plan? Are, have been some schemes like that um, just for people to be allowed to buy into private insurance if they like. My problem with that option and quite honestly, was some of what Joshua was talking about is, again, you're going to put the people who are the most costly into the Medicare program, and you're going to leave people who are the least costly uh, being part of the cherry picking of the insurance companies to be able to cover those people in that middle range. Mm -hmm. And I also know the great human catastrophe and damage that's done to people in that system of private insurance right now. So even though you, you say 68% of the American public who's covered by private insurance gets it through their employer, that has been declining drastically in recent years. Many Americans don't have that option well, anymore. Well, many, many Americans no longer have an employer. That's uh, right. Uh, increasingly, That's people right. are not only unemployed, but self-employed, or yeah, imagine absolutely. that they're self-employed, underemployed. Well, I, I do want to say, even, and, and I, the, the shock to the system, which, you know, I, I respect what Joshua was saying, but it's not as if we're not going to still need those people who work in those sectors. Mm -hmm. We're still going to need nurses. Right. We're still going to need doctors and dentists and, you know, other health care providers. We're still going to need those people. And, you know, I, I, this helps businesses, too. So this is not just for some people, it may be the economic cost. How do we save money, have better outcomes for other people? It may be moral. But when I went to Wisconsin, I talked to a family of small farmers. And recently, maybe about two months ago now, they went to Congress to lobby the Congress. And they told the story of how most of the Congress members thought that they were there to talk about the farm bill. Mm -hmm. Or they weren't there to talk about the farm bill. They, they were there to talk about universal health care. And you know why? Because small farmers, farm families, do not have the health care that they need. And this one, her name is Sarah. She talked about how she, went, she tried to go get health care insurance for her husband before the ACA. So uh, another good part of the ACA and was denied because of the industry that mm -hmm. they're in. And also how mainly in those families, the wife is the one that goes out to get an outside job so that they can have health care for the family. And think about the impact that that has on that family because the same spouse, whether it's the wife or the husband, still has to come back and help with the farm duties. So this is not rural, urban, you know, rural versus urban or suburban, black versus white. This is really about universality in this country that we make it a, pr a premise in this country that health care for all is an absolute right. That's, that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. It's all of us together, no matter what our backgrounds are or our walks of life, we all need access to high quality health care. Josh, you're... you're well, uh, Medicare pays about 10% less on average than um, private insurers and if you rapidly shift everybody in, you, you, if you end up reducing health, you know, we have to control costs. It's a tricky thing, right? That's a key goal of all health care reform is to get costs under control. You have to do it carefully. And the, the, the concerns that I, I hear when I talk to uh, experts in this field is, rural hospitals, clinics serving low-income people. It's not going to be the big city, well-funded, well-endowed hospitals that um, are working at a, at a narrow margin. Uh, it seems to me, again, that I, I have not heard an argument for why it is better to 
shift people who are basically satisfied and accustomed to a system uh, rather than build around them in a way that, that doesn't force them to do something that they don't necessarily want well, to do. We do a I'm major so shift. Okay, go for it. I have go to respond. Go Donna. Donna, Donna, Donna first. Donna. Because uh, yeah. years ago, uh, when we were working on John Conyers' uh, legislation, yes. H.R. 676, and we were coming up with ideas that would counter the Affordable Care Act and the, the people who were trying to get that passed at the time, right. and we were putting single payer forward as an alternative. There was an econometric study that was done by a think tank associated with National Nurses United that showed, now this was in 2009, yeah. that had we shifted to Medicare for All at that time, instead of doing the Affordable Care Act, we would have created 2.6 million new jobs. It was the econometric study studied 26 sectors of the economy and showed what would actually happen in this country. It, imagine, let's go back to 2009, mm -hmm. where this country was economically. Yes. And imagine the difference if we had created 2.6 million new jobs, Joshua. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Disruption, yes, but some of the disruption would also be in a very positive manner. Right, let's take another question from our audience. Good Come on disruption. up to the mic, questioner. Hi. Um, I don't mean this as a as like a gotcha question. Uh, it kind of goes with. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm I, hearing a gotcha I question. I, sincere, I sincerely Sorry. don't. Um, so feel free to not answer if it's not what you want to cover in this. Um, but I bring it up because I see it as intimately linked as one of the two pillars of universal rights, um, health care, and food and shelter. And with one, the other is strengthened. So I'm curious if any of you have thoughts, whoever's comfortable with it, on the idea of a universal basic income um, as something that uh, we were interviewing uh, someone involved in the movement in Canada and, sh and they have their universal health care system and she said that the system works very well except a lot of times the doctors wish they could prescribe cash because the citizens if they can't live healthy they can't go to the gym they have this increased rate of stress that's a, that's a big burden on the health care system itself mm. so if we're going to talk about universal rights and the securing the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think you need health and food and shelter to let people live their healthiest. I'm curious where you guys are on that. You know, Michael Moore, uh, when he was making the decision about where to take Americans for sicko for health care, he took us to Cuba, as some of you will remember. Originally, they were thinking about taking us all to a Scandinavian country, and you know why they didn't? because they felt like most Americans would find that more inflammatory because of the government helps support people when they're ill, when they can't work, when they need support for house payments and other things. I, I have to, pro you know this, when you get sick and somebody's income is impacted, it hurts everyone, and I absolutely support that kind I mean, of idea. It goes idea. to the question of are we asking our health care system to deal with too much? in the same way that we often ask our educational system, our teachers, to, to handle too much. Yeah. Are we expecting too much in a society that isn't actually helping people meet their basic needs at the level of income and housing? I mean, we definitely have to deal with this. And even, I mean, going back to Reverend Dr. King, I mean, he even talked about that in, in some of his push. And one of the last things that he was working on before he was assassinated was the Poor People's Campaign. That's right. You know, and, and what what should we as Americans expect? And so I do want to go back to FDR because I'm, I'm not sure if the president was thinking about a universal income, but he did say in the Economic Bill of Rights of what people should expect. Right. You know, good jobs, you know, housing. good wages, housing, health, and for us to provide as a nation for people who cannot provide for themselves. And so we have to think as the United States of America, where is our humanity? Mm -hmm. Because we have now, we vilify people based on poverty, as if anybody says, when I grow up, I want to be poor. Yeah. You know, I want to be in need. I want to have, nobody, everybody has a dream and they have a hope, but all of us, doesn't, we don't run this race at the same pace. There are inequities. And there's a difference between equality and equity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Equity mm -hmm. says that I'm going to give Donna what she needs, even if it's more than I need. That's equity. And we have to get back to that. So 
it is a conversation that we should have in the whole of what does it mean to look out for our sisters and brothers in this country. And I think raising the minimum wage is one aspect of that, you know, uh, to, to $15 an hour is a start. Again, it's, it's not an end. But we do have to make the requisite investments in our people so that they can compete in this global economy. Next question. Come on up to the mic. Do you think a Medicare for All proposal could pr propel a presidential campaign to victory? Mm, wow. Oh, yeah. what a I do. Oh, yeah. I do. Oh, in, the, yeah. in the form of uh, <laughs> Senator Bernard Sanders. But uh, no, I do. I mean, I think by 2020, I mean, all of the polling is showing that the American public is, is, is peaked on this. Whether we disagree or agree on how it should be done, we have Americans' attention. Mm -hmm. And by 2020, if we continue this trend, it will be the pivotal issue of a presidential campaign. If you don't believe me, the fact that Senator Sanders had tw uh, 16 people, uh, 16 yeah. <laughs> senators standing by his side should be a sign of that. And again, for Congressman Conyers in the House, now 119. So this will be the issue in 2020. Now, but Josh said earlier, this is before the demagoguing begins. We will have had a certain amount of de demagoguing in this last election campaign. We will, we will also have a chance to, to, to counter that. Absolutely. Right? I mean, we will have a chance to counter that. We're doing the educational part of this right now so that the American public can make an informed decision. And there's some reality happening for Americans too. Americans are not without knowledge of the healthcare system. They have to deal with it all the time. Yeah. They know that it's not working well, believe me, they know that. So while we're educating and the system is getting sicker instead of better, the perfect storm is coming to be so that a presidential candidate who does not advocate for fixing this in a meaningful way through a Medicare for All type program, I think does so and risks losing if they don't address it. I mean, we do have a major economic shift happening with respect to people, the way people are earning a living and the way people are living. Far more of us are disconnected from a traditional workplace or an employer. Um, last thought to you, Joshua, I mean, is not this the time on that level to, to push in this way? Well, I, I think that it is a, a very good time to push for a significant expansion of public health care and to, at a minimum, fulfill the unfulfilled promises of the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. I personally hope that we will have an open discussion on the left about how best to get there. I am here, I am not a flack for the drug companies, I'm not a centrist, and I'm saying that there are good reasons to think that the specific proposals that we're talking about right now are not the best ways to go, and we should have that as an open discussion. All right, well this conversation will keep on going for sure. We are just about out of time. Please join me in thanking our guests on this special program, What's at Stake Universal Healthcare, a joint production of Free Speech TV and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you, Nina Turner, for your insights, your activism, and your passion. Thank you, Donna Smith, for your leadership and for sharing your own story. And of course, Joshua Holland for taking a hard look at some of the hard questions concerning Medicare for All. From the Manhattan Neighborhood Network studio at the El Barrio Firehouse in East Harlem, New York, I'm Laura Flanders, and you've been watching What's at Stake, Universal Healthcare on Free Speech TV. Thanks. Nice.